Kia ora, Dan. How are you? I'm good. Thank you, Sarah. How are you doing? Oh, really good. And hello to everyone who's watching. Um, it's been a pleasure hanging out with you for the last few days, Dan. I, um, you've helped us so much with things like the Overdose Prevention Centre concept and helping to get that out, out into the world. Um, and also I felt like I've learned a lot from you about some of the innovative measures um, happening in Canada at the moment. So I really wanted to share those with the audience um, and our supporters here. Um, I was just wondering if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself a little bit for um, Facebook audience. Sure, yeah. Uh, so I'm Dan Werb. I'm the Director of the Centre on Drug Policy Evaluation, which is a research uh, group based in Toronto, Canada, uh, and we're really interested in uh, developing scientific evidence around the impacts of drug policy uh, and different, you know, how in a very expansive sort of definition that includes all of the kinds of interventions that uh, are implemented to uh, prevent people from who use drugs from experiencing harms. Uh, and yeah, I mean, our, our approach is basically to generate really rigorous scientific evidence and then try to communicate that to policymakers and work with community and people with lived experience to, to try to encourage the best, most effective and rights-based approaches to, to substance use. Cool. Um, well, uh, one of the things I was thinking about, and um, feel free, anyone who's watching, to flip through some questions. We're going to keep an eye on those as we go. Um, but one of the things we've talked about a little bit is just how much supply can determine um, use and harms being experienced in, in our countries and society. Um, and that maybe there's been a couple of quite significant um, changes in, in the drug supply in Canada and what the consequences of those were. I was wondering if you would... Um, mind sharing a little bit about that with um, the people who are watching? Yeah, and it, it, it's such a good question and I think so relevant to the uh, situation in New Zealand. Um, New Zealand has to date had a really stable drug supply. There aren't lots of disruptions happening, but of course, you know, about a month ago, we saw this um, rash of overdoses uh, as a result of a cocaine shipment coming in that was actually fentanyl. So, you know, there are indications, uh, particularly as the world uh, drug uh, trafficking networks increasingly are uh, shipping these high potency opioids that New Zealand may see good shots. Um, so, mm. uh, you know, we in Canada have experienced that uh, in two major ways. The first was, um, in the mid 1990s, uh, there was a there, there was a and remains a, a neighborhood in in Vancouver that uh, has a disproportionate amount of um, of injection drug use happening there. It's called uh, Vancouver's downtown east side, and for decades, really, it was a place that um, where we saw heroin being shipped into, uh, and so there was a stable group of people who had been injecting in, uh, heroin and also smoking it. Um, and then suddenly in the 1990s, because of international dynamics around uh, supply side interdiction and the breakup of cartels uh, in uh, Latin America, suddenly there was a shift in the supply. So rather than just heroin being shifted into Can uh, Canada and into Vancouver, suddenly there was this very inexpensive cocaine. And the availability of this very, very cheap cocaine shifted drug use patterns in the downtown east side. So at the time there was a centralized needle exchange program set up. Um, people who were injecting heroin may inject, you know, three times a day at the most, maybe four, but that's, you know, very small group of people. But with the availability of cocaine uh, being so cheap and plentiful, people started shifting to injecting cocaine. And reports from the time, you know, studies that were happening uh, documented that people were injecting cocaine up, up to 20 times a day. So mm -hmm. there was this sudden need, and that's because of the shorter half-life of the drug. Um, there was this sudden need for a massive amount of sterile syringes, but the city was not equipped to provide those. Uh, and so this supply shock with this sudden surge of cheap cocaine 
uh, actually then accelerated uh, uh, an HIV epidemic among uh, that population because suddenly everybody was injecting so much more frequently. Mm -hmm. The city couldn't keep up with the demand in terms of sterile syringes. And uh, very, very rapidly, uh, the HIV prevalence among this population in Vancouver reached close to 30% uh, HIV seropositive. So, I, I mean, it, it was a, an incredible, uh, really, really dire situation that has fortunately been brought under control through a combination of uh, expanded access to like a centralized sterile syringe distribution service, um, a uh, expansion of access to uh, methadone uh, maintenance treatment at the time and uh, other uh, OST opioid substitution treatment modalities since the opening of a supervised injection facility that um, provided people with sterile syringes and a, and a medically supervised place to inject. Uh, and uh, the opening of you know other uh, interventions, including a heroin-assisted treatment program. So, so all of those interventions were needed uh, in in response to this market shock, right? That produced this HIV epidemic. And then more recently, uh, something that people are, I think, more probably familiar with is the North American overdose epidemic, which has its roots in. Um, originally in the expansion of uh, prescribing of um, prescription opioids. But uh, since about five years ago, has really accelerated as a result of a shift again in international drug trafficking markets from uh, primarily shipping heroin to shipping synthetic uh, fentanyl, uh, which is uh, 50 to 100 times more powerful than heroin and uh, carries a significant uh, amount of risk of death. So, uh, you know, there are, I, I think the the situation with, with supply and how to think about, okay, well, how does, how can we prepare for market shocks? I think you have to, on the one hand, understand that these market shocks are kind of inevitable. When we don't control the market, when governments don't control the market, anything can happen. Mm -hmm. uh, that these the the reasons that um, drug markets shift to carry more potent drugs or different drugs is is really out of the control of of um, single kinds, and also that ultimately it's the relationship, the sort of intersection of these drug trafficking patterns and the situations on the ground in a country that are going to determine the kinds of risks that people experience. Yeah. And so that's quite a stark warning for New Zealand, really. And I think about a couple of summons, summers ago, half of our MDMA supply um, became uh, a synthetic cathinone. Essentially, it got switched out for a synthetic cathinone uh, called Ushalone within the space of less than two months, uh, we think. Um, and so I'm just curious, uh, thinking about that risk of an opioid um, uh, contamination here, or indeed an epidemic being experienced. Uh, you know, we're in a bit of a special situation here where we haven't had to deal with that. Um, and I'm wondering if you were in charge and you were thinking about the things that you would love to see uh, put in place here, what you might um, encourage New Zealand to prepare with. Well, that is the first time anyone has ever offered to put me in charge of New Zealand. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> thank you for that. I will decline You're your offer. You're officially in charge. Um, I've got the only vote. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, I I think the best position. I mean, New Zealand is in in this incredibly lucky position, right? Mm. There is that you can learn from the experiences and the mistakes of other countries, right? So Canada's response has been ultimately very innovative, but it took way too long to get off the ground, and we have been in reactive mode in terms of trying to get these interventions out for decades. Um, mm -hmm. And at, at this point now, you know, that has really put us on the back foot in terms of controlling the overdose epidemic in, uh, in our country. Um, mm -hmm. For New Zealand, you know, there are some incredibly simple, inexpensive approaches uh, that can be put in place. And I would say the number one thing to do to uh, prevent people from dying of an opioid overdose is to make sure that naloxone, this um, uh, opioid antagonist drug, 
is made widely available. So for those that don't know, uh, naloxone is an inexpensive medication that uh, essentially blocks the capacity of the brain to absorb opioids. So it will immediately reverse an, uh, an overdose, uh, depending on the, uh, the potency of the opioid that's been, that was ingested. But um, in any case, it's incredibly effective at keeping people alive. And it's incredibly easy to administer. Uh, you know, you basically either shoot it intramuscularly or um, there's a, a nasal version as well. Um, and just making this available to community, to people who serve people who use drugs, to paramedics, um, and just blanketing as much as possible the country of the naloxone can be an, uh, probably the most single, the single most effective way to prevent people from dying if there is a sudden market shock. Um, the other things mm. that you can put in place are, um, of course, overdose prevention sites, which um, you know you have uh, the New Zealand Drug Foundation obviously launched the the call for a proposal for opi uh, for an overdose prevention site over the weekend, or pardon me, earlier this week. I don't even know what day it is. <laughs> you don't know so, what day it is. So slightly jet lagged, but <laughs> I was there. Um, and you know, I think establishing sites like those in advance of problems yeah. again, you can you can have such an incredible impact by creating these preventive measures uh, before um, before things get really, really dire. That's great. Um, and yeah, as you know, we're pushing for both that and the naloxone access here in, in New Zealand, which we continue to um, struggle to get across the line. Um, we've had a question come in, which I'll just, uh, re you know, reflect back to you. So um, what a, what is it about Canada that it's made it politically possible to do these innovative things? And is it simply because of the scale of the crisis? I know you and I have been chatting a little bit about this. So, um, yeah. It's a great question. And yes, it, I mean, in the case of Vancouver, uh, it was the scale of the crisis locally, right? Again, I, I mentioned it was close to 30% of people who were injecting drugs were HIV positive in 1996. So that was the, the highest prevalence of any population outside of Sub-Saharan Africa at the time. Um, and it was a stark warning, right? And, and it's incredible the kind of public education that happens amidst a crisis. So that really changed the, the dynamic in Vancouver, um, yeah, and, and the openness of people to considering a supervised injection site. And, and in fact, at the time, uh, the chief coroner of the city ran for mayor on a platform that they had seen too much death and they were going to implement a supervised injection facility and they were elected on that promise. So, um, you know, it was, but again, it was just the stark realization of how, how badly things had gotten, uh, that um, rapid change, but again, rapid change, I would say, you know, way too late. Um, and, and certainly not in a preventive way. And the same thing has happened with, um, the overdose epidemic. Um, I, I, I would contrast it a little bit with the United States, but even in the United States, which is, you know, essentially the, the epicenter of um, moralistic drug policy and prohibitionist um, funding of, of drug policies internationally, there are supervised injection facilities now mm -hmm. operating in the United States. There are overdose yeah. prevention sites now operating. Um, and uh, the embrace of harm reduction has, has now occurred at the highest levels. The US Office on National Drug Control Policy is, is really scrambling to get a number of harm reduction measures put in place. Far too late, of course, far too late, yeah. but it's just remarkable what crisis can do. Um, my sense of New Zealand having been here for a few days is that, uh, you know, it is in many ways a very pragmatic country. And um, I, I think that I hope can can serve you well in in uh, establishing these these kinds of approaches before uh, you face crisis. Mm. 
I, th I was just going to ask you, I can see questions come through, but I'm just going to ask you um, another one myself, um, which is about um, one of the interesting things you were telling me about the other day, which is a supply side intervention. So I was just wondering if you could give us any sort of insights into, into you know, what you might consider to be the best supply side intervention, because I know that you're quite desperate to see uh, less harm from fentanyl occurring um, in particular in Canada. Yeah, you know, my my approach to this is every drug market is regulated by somebody. So if it's not regulated by government, it's regulated by somebody else. It's regulated by drug trafficking organizations uh, and non-state actors. And the question that we really need to pose is, okay, if, if we understand that supply-side interdiction is not a very effective way of controlling drug markets or shaping them. And you can look at the literature. They're really not. Um, the, the evidence internationally bears that out from basically every single um, country. So then what can governments do? And I, I would say that the classic, for all of its violence, uh, the classic approach of kind of uh, seizures and interdictions and, and border security, um, that is a very very minimal approach to regulating a market that really cedes most of the regulation to drug trafficking organizations. And, and you know, we've seen this, uh, I, th I think we see this all the time uh, with drug markets that we take for granted as regulated. So alcohol is a great one. Um, <clears throat> in Canada last year, Bombay, Bombay Sapphire Gin, or sorry, this was, this was three years ago, Bombay Sapphire Gin accidentally shipped a uh, a pallet of gin that was double proof, right? So it got to the it got to the liquor stores, and it was twice as potent as it well, was was labeled. Somebody bought some, took a sip. was like this is there's something wrong with this. Brought the the bottle back to the market and back to the liquor store, and then all of those bottles were removed from stores. Mm -hmm. That's an incredibly well-regulated market, right? I mean, in right, terms of, you can quibble with the way that alcohol is regulated, but <laughs> yeah. but in terms of the capacity of that system to remove adulteration and mm. handle contamination, I mean, that's great. Nobody died, nobody got sick. Now you mm. can contrast that with what happened when a cocaine shipment uh, was actually um, mislabeled, uh, or, you know, was mislabeled fentanyl or when fentanyl is adulterating other drugs, there's no consumer protection in place. There's no way for us to engage with that market um, in a meaningful way to save lives. So ultimately, I, I think if you look at this problem long enough, and I was part of a federal task force in Canada that was uh, struck by the, the federal health minister last year that included police, uh, psychiatrists, uh, people working in the construction industry um, and, a, and a whole range of stakeholders. And, that, and by the end, our, our recommendation was that we needed to regulate, s establish regulatory frameworks distinct for each drug type. And yeah. I, I think that's, you know, if you look at this problem long enough, that's ultimately the solution that, that seems to be the most effective. Just bouncing off of that into um, the New Zealand market and the 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 con people people's primary concern, and I'm just noting we've got a couple of minutes left uh, here in Aotearoa, is with methamphetamine that that's generally considered to be the most harmful drug, although in some measures alcohol was um, up there with meth. Um, I'm curious about any um, uh, innovative measures that have um, been are being or have been trialed in Canada around methamphetamine? Yeah, I, it, so this is this has long been a scientific uh, aim, uh, I would say certainly across North America, but but uh, globally. I mean, the search for effective drugs for, you know, to have something along the lines of opioid substitution treatment, but for methamphetamine. And there have been some advances recently with clinical trials uh, in the United States. Steve Shoptaw's group at uh, UCLA uh, ran a trial of uh, bupropion uh, last year that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine that showed some really interesting and uh, very, very positive results with respect to the capacity of that drug to act as um, 
sort of an effective substitute for for methamphetamine. Um, in Canada, we there are regionally uh, issues, particularly in the, in the eastern provinces and the maritime provinces in Canada. There's a a greater or a disproportionate um, uh, level of harm related to methamphetamine use, and um, as a result, uh, there is uh, a, our our essentially our national network of um, researchers on substance use are undertaking a clinical trial looking at. Uh, methamph drugs that can effectively act um, uh, to to be substitutes for methamphetamine. So the search for, uh, you know, the the scientific search for these drugs, the trialing of these drugs, evidence on the effectiveness of of different potential candidates is really really important. Um, and it would seem to me that New Zealand would be a, a perfect setting for this kind of scientific research. Uh, and uh, into experimental treatments, particularly, you know, just as you've said, because of the scale of the problem here mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the the level of um, of scientific expertise that that uh, is here in New Zealand. Mm. I think we've got time for the one last really short question there, and then maybe with the other one, we'll answer it directly on Facebook in the chat. Um, is Canada seeing any other drugs of concern coming through? What what might be the next fentanyl? Is that is that a question to answer? Yeah, I mean, if you look at the last hundred or so years of, or 120 years of um, drug market advances in opioids, you know, we went from opium to laudanum to morphine, to heroin, to fentanyl. I mean, each time we're seeing increasing potency, right, in products. And, and that's a result of the ongoing search for efficiency in the market, right? Yeah. As interdiction improves, drug trafficking organizations and, and drug producers respond. And the response is always to get more efficient. Like it's, it's why every single time a new phone comes out, it's either smaller or more powerful, right? And it's exactly the same forces that happen in uh, the drug trafficking, in drug trafficking markets. Um, so yeah, I mean, the, it's, I would say almost inevitable that there will be an ex-fentanyl. We're already seeing it uh, in Canada with the increasing uh, distribution and trafficking of nitazine class opioids, which are 50 to 100 times more powerful than fentanyl. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, it just goes on and on, and it's it's an endless uh, tug of war between supply side interdiction and and the efforts of, uh, of drug trafficking organizations. And that drug made a brief appearance here in uh, New Zealand a few months ago, fortunately, in a very small way. Um, yeah, look, Dan, I just want to thank you so much for your time. It's been um, great. We'll see you again later today. But um, thank you on behalf of the Facebook audience. And we'll get in there and answer that other question um, in the chat. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, for your time. Yeah. Okay. Bye. See you.